Welcome everybody. My name's George Kamora out there watching and thank you so much for joining us. Today I've got a bit of a, uh, a lineup of, I guess it's like brand ambassador royalty. Uh, from Starwood, we're going to have Maddie Follant from Jamison, Helen McAleer from Buffalo Trace, G David from Jack Daniels Rye, Linus Shaxman, and from Glenfiddich, Ross Blaney. Now Linus and Maddie are here at Beneath Driver Lane with me, and we have the other guys stuck in Sydney, unfortunately, because of COVID. So why are we here? Um, it is a great time at the moment to be selling whiskey and uploading whiskey. Uh, we're finding that the trends at the moment is customers are buying quality over quantity. And today we're going to try five whiskies from all around the world. And just to get you guys that are a little bit of like beginners to whiskey to learn a little bit about these products. And um, I'm really super excited. So for our first whiskey that we're going to try today, I have Maddie Follant from Starwood. Uh, welcome, Maddie. Thanks, George. Uh, Maddie's a bit of a Geelong boy like me, <laughs> so I've got to put the Geelong plug in. Uh, we're going live uh, pretty much around Australia today. So as I said, uh, great turnout, Matt. And um, I guess what we can do is, for those of you, if you want to grab your first sample, which is the Starwood Twofold, I'm going to open up my yeah, bottle and we'll it. pour ourselves a little bit of a dram. And uh, you want to talk a little bit about this, Matt? Yeah, for sure. So Starwood as a brand, we were founded here in Melbourne in 2007. Dave Vitali is our founder. Uh, Dave wanted to create unique Australian whiskey that was truly accessible uh, for everyone to enjoy. Starwood Twofold is the, the definition of that. Very accessible whiskey. Uh, the way we make it, we make two different whiskies. One's a malt uh, and the other is a wheat whiskey. We mature those independently in red wine barrels that we source locally uh, and then blend that together post maturation at a 60% wheat to 40% malt component. Uh, the wheat brings that lightness, that sweetness, that softness, uh, and then the malt brings you that big tropical fruit note that uh, Starwood's known for. Combine that together with that beautiful red wine characteristics that you get from the barrel. Uh, yeah, it's just a really versatile, easy drinking whiskey for everyone to enjoy. Excellent. And as we go through a little bit of a nosing, do you want to run through a nosing and a tasting for our, yeah, our viewers for sure. and guys? So Starwood's known for its uh, tropical fruit aroma. You get that in most of our whiskies. So think bananas and pineapples, etc. Sometimes a bit of mango skin in there. Uh, so that's definitely on the nose and you get that beautiful vanilla note coming from uh, the American oak we use. We use a lot of American oak X red wine. Uh, but then there's that always that underlying red wine characteristic coming through. Uh, a lot of the casks that we fill up at Starwood are fresh, fresh filled, so literally straight from the winery to the distillery and filled up with our new make spirit. So you always have that big influence of red wine. Uh, and don't think of it as 30 mils of whiskey with a dash of Shiraz on top. It's not how it works. It's, it's, the red wine comes through as uh, red fruits, uh, berries, plums, apples, etc., and a beautiful tannin spice on the back of the palate as well. That's awesome. So uh, for those of you out there as well, guys, we do have some questions. If you'd like to fill out the questions in the comments, if we don't get through them all today, we will definitely follow up and send them out to you. And I might just ask you a few questions as well as we go. Yeah, for sure. Um, as far as the wine cast, is it from a certain region or a certain brand? Uh, we've used a lot of different casks over the years. Uh, now, most of the time, we, we focus on as, well, as close as we can to the distillery. We get a lot of good French oak, uh, ex Pinot from the Yarra Valley, uh, also a lot of um, American oak, ex Shiraz from the Barossa. We're looking for those red wine varieties that are going to give us big, red, juicy characteristics. So Shiraz, Pinots, Cabernets, uh, that's what we focus on. Uh, and then over the years, we've started working with some suppliers that have given us really good, consistent casts. So uh, great cooperage out of the Barossa Valley called AP Johns. They work closely with Treasury Wine Estates and obviously great wine coming from there uh, and great barrels that are well looked after and not too old and dusty and they've still got a lot of life to give to our whiskey yeah awesome and when you said a lot of life uh, what difference does it make using a different type of barrel for the age uh, for the flavor and the taste i guess of your whiskey yeah good question george huge a huge amount yeah 60 to 70 percent of the flavor is coming from our barrel uh, and we only give it three to four years to mature uh, in in melbourne because of our unique climate here so it happens pretty quick and pretty fast 
Um, and different types of oaks will give different flavour to your whisky. So American oak will give you those vanillas and coconut flavour, uh, whereas the, the French oak is more of that winter spice and back palate spice you get. Uh, but then also what's previously been in the barrel has a massive effect and that's accentuated when you are filling a, fr a fresh cask as well. You're not just scraping out the inside and doing a shave, toast and rechar. Uh, they're still wet with wine in this case, so there's a lot of flavour saturated into that oak. And then when we add our new make spirit, uh, it's pulling all of that flavour out. Recording in progress. Really, really quickly. Yeah. Awesome. And um, now you said that it's single malt and grain whiskey. Yep. Yep. Is there a reason why? It's too different. Or? Yeah, we want to we want to make a whiskey that's accessible uh, in both price point, but also in flavour. Uh, as I, I love big, full-bodied uh, single malt whiskies, as we have a few here, or yeah, one here with Glenfiddich. Um, however, for those entering the category or in, you know drinking whiskey for the first time, sometimes a single malt can be a bit too a bit too punchy. Uh, so that wheat allows us to to have a really versatile whiskey and bring that lightness and that sweetness there as well. Yeah. That's awesome. And I think um, from a, a venue owner's point of view too, sometimes when you have something that is uh, at a really great price, it, it can allow us to use it as our rail pour and, and use it in our cocktails and stuff exactly, like that that's too. Exactly, so, Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Um, also, Aussie Spirits at the moment. Now, I'm not sure how many distilleries there are. Uh, oh, yeah. I think I read something the other day, there's something like 3,000 just different gins in Australia at the moment. Doesn't um, surprise me at all. <laughs> it's, it's great and you know we, we love getting on board with, with everything Australia and all the other guys from uh, the other brands are probably saying hey you know you've got to drink our products too but uh, are you finding that the trends are that people are, are drinking a lot more Australian now or what, what's on trend? Yeah definitely. Uh, COVID's definitely accentuated that and sped that up but also people are wanting new and exciting and different we're a new world whiskey distillery we love the old world and the traditional ways of making whiskey as you know a lot of these brands have been doing for hundreds of years however we want to push the boundary of what whiskey can be and especially in Australia sort of redefine and rediscover what Australian whiskey is we don't want to make Australian scotch or Australian bourbon we want to you know educate people and show people what Australian whiskey is. So yeah, definitely people are, are looking local, uh, but they're wanting something different, something to talk about and to share with friends. Yeah, yeah awesome. So running through the tasting, what, what should I be picking up? Let's have a bit of a taste on the nose. As you said, I can definitely get those, those tropical fruits. I get a little bit of banana there. Yeah, for sure. Um, that, that's coming from our, our malt. Yeah, getting a lot of that high ester fruit forward. Um, we use a brewer's uh, yeast when we ferment. Uh, and that gives us that really nice banana note in, it, in our spirit profile. So you definitely get that. Uh, and then the grains coming through, sweet malt, uh, nice sort of sweetness from the, the, the wheat as well. And then you're getting that wine coming through is that those red berries, almost like a strawberry shortcake on the nose. Yeah, really quite light and easy. What do you think, Linus? You're uh, sitting here coming from a... <laughs> you're presenting American whiskey. Are you a fan? Absolutely. It's, it's a... Local city, it's a great distillery. Uh, you spot on right that tropical fruits are absolutely there for sure, and that's kind of like, I think almost like your like your trademark, yeah. That, like yeah, banana fruit. It's great. It's light. It's accessible. It's easy to drink. It's a absolute cracker. Yeah, it's kind of funny talking having both of you next to me. I get that similar banana. You're gonna say that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. Now, yeah, for is sure. that the yeast? Is it that like obviously the grains from different parts of the world? Is it? Is it just a coincidence? And in the case of Jack Daniels, we use a live yeast, so it's actually definitely from our yeast. I'm not too sure about you guys, but there's definitely a similarity there for sure. Yeah, for sure. It comes from our yeast as well. The brewer's yeast we use uh, is like a European wheat beer style yeast. Uh, and so like if you have a drunk a Hefeweizen, you're getting those yeah, banana yeah. tropical fruit notes, very similar vibes to that. Yeah, yeah awesome. For those of you uh, that are, uh, are with us, don't be scared if, if you don't get banana or tropical fruits. I remember when I first started tasting whiskey, I'd be listening to what the guys were saying. I'm going, uh, yeah, it just tastes like whiskey to me. We're all different. There's no right. There's no wrong. However, I think I find with style, style what I, banana is one of the main things that I would get there. So um, as far as serving suggestions go, I, I saw twofold and tonic yeah. of all things. Yeah, whiskey and tonic, a, a bit of a, a curveball there. Um, those big wine characteristics that we get from our maturation process uh, allows us to, to have a versatile whiskey and make whiskey that per pairs perfectly with tonic water. Uh, it's almost like a, a nice little aperitif if you've ever had like a aromatised wine and tonic yeah, yeah. or vermouth and tonic. Similar vibe to that. Yeah, slice of grapefruit 
uh, and it's good to go. Yeah. That's awesome. And you mentioned before about the climate. Yeah. How much does the climate make a difference then? You're saying that Melbourne's pretty, like I know we have four seasons in one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that consistently varying climate that we get in both Australia seasonally, but then uh, smaller to that Melbourne daily from those four seasons in one day has a massive effect on the, the speed of the maturation. So every time the cask uh, heats up, the pores in that oak will open up and the whiskey will dive in. Uh, and when it cools down, it contracts and forces the whiskey out and pulls colour, flavour, texture, maturity, etc. So the more variation you get, the quicker the maturation process is. So for Melbourne, we say it's about uh, one Melbourne year is three Scottish years <laughs> in terms of maturation, just because of our, our dynamic climate that we get here. Yeah. Awesome. So one in three. Um, Angel Share. Yeah. <laughs> Can you, do you want to explain a little bit about Angel Share? Because we've got some other uh, distilleries that have massive Angel yeah. Share mm. as well. Yeah, so for us, we, on average, about 4 to 5% a year uh, evaporation, uh, de depending on the size of your cask. Uh, so we do lose you know, volume in, in the barrel, unfortunately. Um, but on average, yeah, about 4 or 5% a year across all of our barrels. If we're using a 50 or 100 litre cask, that can get close to, to double digits pretty quickly. Uh, another reason why we don't mature it for you know, more than four years because we won't have much left at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, it, it does have a massive effect when it comes to maturity and uh, how long we let it sit for. It kind of sounds crazy, the fact that you go out, get a still, make some whiskey, yeah. put it into or some new make, put it into a barrel and then 10 years down the track, half of it's gone. Already. Yeah, so yeah, that's a sacrifice we're willing to make. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. That's great. Um, I'm pretty good for questions. Is there anything else you want to tell us about Selwood? I'm a massive fan. Uh, is there anything new coming? We always have new stuff down the line. We have a, a range called the Projects, uh, and that's all pretty limited stuff, uh, one-off. As I said, we're a New World whiskey, so we, we have fun. We do little experiments here, there, and everywhere, whether that's a ginger beer cask or a tawny cask. We, um, yeah, we're always releasing a, a few things that uh, I can't speak of anything coming up, unfortunately. I'll get a little slap on the wrist, but yeah, we, we, we do have some cool stuff in the pipeline. And you're back up now, aren't you? Because you were closed for a while, didn't have uh, renovations? Yeah, so we upgraded last year, so it uh, wasn't just COVID that shut us down. <laughs> we were renovating for about six, six months. Uh, new mezzanine floor in the distillery, new 7,000 litre wash still. Uh, and yeah, lots of lots of other infrastructure there to double our capacity of production, which is really exciting. So yeah, obviously looking to grow a lot more over the next five to ten years. Yeah. That's awesome. And as far as growth goes, like I can remember going to Essendon Fields when, yeah, I mean, when it too, first yeah. opened. Yeah, <laughs> there, were, there weren't a lot of barrels in, in nah, the warehouse. Nah. How much has it grown? Yeah, <laughs> massively. Obviously started in Essendon Fields. Yeah. Um, you know, released our first whiskey in 2013. 2016, we moved to Port Melbourne, our home now. Yeah, it's, it's grown pretty significantly. Uh, we've got a second warehouse out in Brooklyn as well that we're starting to fill up now. It's just barrel space. If you come down to the distillery in Port Melbourne, you'll see that we are at, uh, yeah, at capacity in terms of space for barrels, so we need to start filling up more. But yeah, we're, we're growing Amazing. and it, it's, it's fun to try and keep up. That's great. And for our, our customers and all the guys online at the moment, how accessible are you? Can they come down to the warehouse because unfortunately you're about the only one we can go to. I'd love to just walk into Jamison next week. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah, was uh, sure, meant yeah. to be something I was going to do this year. Can they come and, and visit and have a look at the distillery? Yeah, for sure. So we're open uh, Thursday to Sunday, uh, midday to 10 p.m. Uh, so you're welcome to come in and have a few drinks, cool bar there, 300 person bar depending on restrictions. Um, and yeah, tours and masterclasses operating uh, all these days. Yeah. That's fantastic. Just make sure that you try it at Starwood. Come back to work and order through your boss and the venue, okay? <laughs> through Paramount. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, you're going to hang around for a little while. All right, next up, I'm going to introduce to you from Pena Ricard and Jamison, Helen Meckley. And now, Helen, have I pronounced it right? I've been stressing all morning. Hi, everyone. Um, how are you? You pronounced it okay. Um, it's Helen Meckley, but you're close enough, so I'll give you that. It's a hard one to pronounce. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's the most stressful thing I, I had for today. So, um, that's good. would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Helen McAleer, and I'm the Jemison Brand Ambassador based here in Sydney. I've been the Brand Ambassador for the last two years here in Australia. But previous to this, um, I was actually the Jemison Ambassador in England for a year. And hopefully you can tell from my accent, I am, in fact, um, Irish. Um, so it's great to really, you know, champion the brand that I'm so passionate about, especially where it's created where I'm from. 
Um, but yeah, that's just a little intro on me. Fantastic. Now, as I said before, I was meant to go to Ireland this year, but unfortunately, it's not going to happen due to COVID. I know. Can so I ask you I one question I before we go into the tasting? We'll was it the Irish yeah. or the Scotch that actually started whiskey? Well, <laughs> I'm going to say, I'd love to say Irish, but I'm going to say Scotch. And I'll touch on it a little bit later on, but Je uh, John Jemison, who actually created Jemison, was in fact a Scotsman as well. Um, something I hate to say, but yeah, he was in fact. Well, actually, I want to hear that because I've always heard the other way around and I can see Ross Blaney would uh, definitely want to get into uh, that conversation. He's smiling over there, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to try the Jamison Black Barrel. I'm a massive fan of this. Uh, I have this in all of the venues uh, that I own. So we've poured ourselves some. Uh, for those of you online guys, please pour yourself your Jamison Dram. And Helen, if you could take us through a bit of a tasting, would be fantastic. Absolutely. Although before we jump into the taste, and I don't know if this is okay, but I might run through a little bit about the history of Jemison because it really informs this whole story on Jemison and Jemison Black Barrel particularly as well. But just quickly for a little bit of context. So Jemison has been around for nearly 200 years and it was created by a man called John Jemison. And I've already given it away, but he was in fact Scottish. And very interestingly, he married into a whiskey family over in Scotland, um, which he married into Hate Club, which is a huge Scotch in the UK. He married into that family and he learned everything he could possibly learn about whiskey. And then he set sail and uh, went over to Ireland and created his distillery in Bow Street in Dublin. I'm not sure if anyone's been to Ireland before. I'm sure there are many of you have been. Um, the distillery is absolutely amazing. Um, but what I just wanted to talk about in terms of the history is I'm sure everyone's seen, you know, a bottle of Jameson before they've that, you know, everyone recognized that iconic green bottle, but in every single bottle of Jemison, you can see if you look closely, there's a little, um, a crest and a Latin phrase that says Cine Metu, which is a really nice story um, for Jemison because I'm not sure if there's any Latin speakers here, but it translates to without fear. And I think this is a real testament um, to the Irish whiskey category in general, because, you know, Jemison is obviously huge and a massive Irish whiskey, but for the last 200 years, you know, it wasn't always really plain sailing. There was a lot of challenges for the Irish whiskey category. So I suppose around um, the turn of the 20th century, you know, we were fighting like world wars and um, there was obviously prohibition in America. Irish whiskey was absolutely booming at this stage, but all of these little things were just nails in the coffin for the Irish whiskey category. And then you had the likes of obviously prohibition. Uh, England was ruling us and they kept slapping taxes onto us. So very interestingly, we used malted and unmalted barley in our whiskey because um, the good frugal Irish man was like, how do we get around tax? So they actually put unmalted barley in. But once we taste it very shortly, you'll really appreciate the smoothness in the whiskey. Um, but yeah, it's great to see that kind of in the turn of the 21st century, you know, Irish whiskey has really started to come back online. It's absolutely booming. There was over a thousand distilleries at the very, uh, when John Jemison was around, it went down to about four in the 1960s. And it's great to see there's around 30 distilleries coming back to Ireland. So, you know, Irish whiskey is really booming. And yeah, I just want to tell you a little bit about the history before we jumped in to do the tasting. So if you've got any questions, just shout away. But I think it's time to taste the incredible Jemison Black Barrel. Any little bit of history about the brands? It's uh, yeah, it's I think it's so interesting as well. Yeah, but definitely. yeah, and... yeah, it's always hard when it's virtual, isn't it? Who's talking or who's talking over who? But yeah, Jemison Black Barrel. So obviously, Jemison Original has been you know our classic whiskey, and um, for over two hundred years. But Jemison Black Barrel is a little tech, and I think you can tell from the bottle, the packaging. It comes in a beautiful black box. It's a bit of a premium upsell from Jemison Original. And the reason it has this premium quality is because it's still a blend of pot still and grain whiskey, but we use a higher proportion of pot still whiskey in, our, in Black Barrel. So it sets it more onto like a pedestal with the likes of Redbreast, which is also made in our distillery and our array of amazing Irish whiskies. And that's a real quintessential style of Irish whiskey. So we use a higher pot still um, percentage and you'll really get that through the whiskey. You know, you'll get that lovely spice, the warmness, but the reason it's called Jemison Black Barrel is because it's actually matured in double charred barrels. So obviously lots of barrels will get charred, but the barrels we finish our whiskey in, our oak barrels, are actually double charred. So, you know, you're going to get a lot of um, vanilla extract coming out of that and it's going to be really sweet, but not, not like too sweet, but really sweet, really warm. You'll get a lot of vanilla, caramel and toffee flavours coming through. 
So what I what I would encourage everyone to do with their little sample is, you know, don't be afraid to really get your nose in there and take a massive smell of the whiskey. I'm sure you have all tried Jemson original before, but Black Barrel might be a new one that you haven't tried. So I just think that smells incredible. Like you can really get that vanilla coming through. There's a little bit of spice and um, kind of like what Matt was saying. I can get a little bit of banana and tropical flavors coming through in the Jemison Black Barrel as well. A little bit of nuttiness as well. Yeah. And this is a thing like it's so it's open to anybody. You can really whatever you get from it, it's, you know, up to interpretation. But yeah, that kind of nuttiness um, from the pot still, the spice, but lovely tropical and sweet flavors as well. And then if you take a sip, like something I always encourage as well when you're tasting whiskey is a lot of people might not see Jemison as a sipping, you know, premium style whiskey. But just I would encourage all to leave it on your tongue for a few seconds and really appreciate that triple distill, the smoothness, the sweetness and that double charring coming through with those amazing tastes of like butterscotch, caramel. When I taste Black Barrel, I nearly think it's like. Do you know a Werther's original that your granny used to give you when you used to go visit her? That's what Black Barrel tastes like. It's just incredible. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, is it aged as well in sherry casks or is it just yeah, all American? Yeah, so it's, yeah, so Jemison original and Jemison Black Barrel, they're both aged in bourbon and sherry, but then it's just the finish that it's in double charred oak barrels. That's finished roughly. Yeah, so it's actually, it's matured for around 9 to 12 years, but with most of the Jemison bar, the likes of 18, we don't really shout and scream about how long we mature our whiskey for. And then it's finished in those double tar barrels for anywhere between six months to a year. Awesome. And I know it's very common in Ireland. Why triple distillation? Triple distillation? It's just the magic number of three. All good things come in three. Um, no, I think, you know, um, they obviously tried a variety of ways and they just find that that triple distillation, you know, it doesn't um, take too much out of the whiskey, but it still contributes to that lovely um, smooth taste that you get and those lovely flavours coming through. The, the grain whiskey and the pot still, do you blend them together and put them in the barrels or do you age them separately and then blend together? So we would we would usually um, put them separately and then blend together after. And even the likes of the grain whiskey, it's usually um, aged in the likes of the sherry and then our pot still in bourbon because the flavour profiles are more in sync with those two types of wood, which is really interesting as well. That's awesome. And I think it's exciting times for Irish whiskey at the moment. I think we've gone from, what, four to about over 30 distilleries in the last few oh, years, 20 well, years, which is great. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. And even um, another interesting fact of any history buffs out there is that, you know, when the gems or when the Irish whiskey category was falling apart, there was only four distilleries left on the island of Ireland in the 70s. And Jemison actually merged with Powers, which is an incredible Irish whiskey as well, um, and Cork distillers. And those three distilleries merging together and Jemison moved from Dublin down to Cork um, in the southwest of Ireland. Like, for three big massive competitors to come together and merge to really save Irish whiskey and they decided to obviously champion Jemison it was such a great move back then what 56 years ago that's obviously reaping the rewards now is you know every bar has Jemison original but a huge internal mission that we want is for every bar to have Jemison original and black barrels sitting beside it because it deserves place it's an incredible whiskey um, and I hope you can all agree with that as well. Well, I totally agree. I think I've drank too many picklebacks in my time and uh, Jemison's definitely <laughs> Well, this makes a great shot. pickleback as well. And another interesting point on this as well is Jemison Black Barrel was actually um, launched for South Africa. So it was launched as an exclusive to South Africa. It's our second biggest market for Irish whiskey. And uh, apparently the culture over there is like, you know the way we would buy our friends or mates rounds? They go and they buy a bottle to show their wealth and stuff and they can't get enough of Jemison. So we made this black bar exclusive to them and it was called Jemison Select Reserve. So you might've seen a few bottles of these floating around before, but because so many people around the world got their lips on this amazing liquid, there was a demand for it to be supplied all over the world. So that's why they rebranded it to Jemison Black Barrel so that it's more accessible for everyone. And it's not this like select reserve just for one market. So very interesting as well. And that's lucky awesome. for us that we can now drink it as well. Yeah, look, I'm a massive fan as well as the cast mates. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we drink a fair bit of Jamison down in Geelong anyway. Yeah. I'm sure everyone oh, you're else me. around the world. <laughs> um, signature serves or recommendations. Obviously, it's beautiful to sip on. 
What are other suggestions you this can give This is the us? thing. Like, it's absolutely beautiful to sip on. You know, that just neat on a cold winter's night. This is the perfect time. Or if you're in a two-week lockdown, you know, I'm definitely digging into this bottle. It's perfect neat. Um, it's even really nice with a boiler maker, you know, with some beer. But something that I would really encourage people to try, Jemison Black Bar Island, is, you know, try it in the likes of a whiskey sour, an old-fashioned. It's 40% ABV, similar to Jemison Original, but it really stands up really well. You know, you can really, it's got like an extra bite compared to Jemison Original. It stands up really well in cocktails. But something I actually just made whilst I was waiting to come on was... Now, it might look a little bit diluted now, but just Jemison soda and a slice of orange. It's so simple. You know, everyone, every bar has soda and oranges or any fruit. Most people in their house will have that lying around. So it's a really easy drink just to make up if you're, you know, if you're getting a little bit thirsty, it's coming to 5 p.m. Really easy drink. And honestly, it's super refreshing. And again, just really simplistic. Awesome. Fantastic. Do you guys have any questions? What do you think? It's an absolute cracker. It's yeah. fantastic. Um, nah. Yeah, great whiskey. Great whiskey. I, I've, I've, I've been to Jameson, checked it out, and it's a pretty amazing place. And Cork's a great town as well, so I had a great time there. So, no. I, I, although I did ask an Irish person why they did distill Jameson three times. I was told it was to be sure, to be sure, to be sure. So, uh, I don't know if that... <laughs> I've sorry. heard that joke so many times in my new so plan <laughs> Bad joke. <laughs> Sorry, That's awesome. yeah. Matt, Matt, what do you think? Are you, are you a yeah. fan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, really light, easy drinking from that triple distillation. And it's got a beautiful texture, that pot still coming through. Yeah, great body to it. Yeah, actually, I really do like that that nice oiliness in the de texture there. And guys, we know that Jamison is in pretty much every single bar around the world. You'd be surprised not to find a bottle of Jamison. And as I said, for your perfect upsell now, we're finding. At, at the venues down, you know, in Geelong and Ballarat uh, that I own, that we can't go to, to Jamison, we can't go to Jack Daniels or Glen Fedix, so we're spending money here. Don't be scared, don't be shy to upsell to these brands because the, the trend is definitely there, we're finding it. The cost per head is, has gone up remarkably. And now I guess is your time to learn as much as you can for you more novice beginner bartenders and get that knowledge behind you. And, and don't be scared because customers enjoy the upsell as much as the uh, the venue owners do too because it's uh, a little bit more money in the in the till to uh, pay rent for the next shutdown. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, hand over next to uh, Mr. G. David, I haven't oh. seen you for a while. Look out. Welcome. Hey, George. I'm uh, good, mate. Been a long time. Great. Thanks to Paramount, we can uh, chat again. <laughs> you like that plug? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, today we're going to gonna get, have before. you talk a little bit about bourbon, the category bourbon and Buffalo Trace. And I, I've told a million customers it is what got me to start drinking bourbon many, many years ago. Uh, yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? And we might, while I'm pouring, we can talk a little bit about Buffalo Trace and I might have a few questions. I'd love to even know a little bit about the category of bourbon, if you can tell us some of the laws uh, that are related to it, please. Yeah, sure. Mate. Look, <clears throat> it's, um, it's a big love affair for me. I, I, uh, I've been, <clears throat> in my, the start of my career, um, a bartender for many, many years. And I was fortunate enough to be working in London when Buffalo Trace launched in 1999. So I feel like I've, uh, I've got the, the closed loop full circle now working with a brand here in Australia, which is a great story for me personally, but I've seen this brand grow and uh, become the brand that it really belongs uh, or, or affords to be in our, um, our sort of bartending community, which is uh, really where um, its strength is. The, um, so my background with, with drinks, obviously from bartending, uh, all sorts of different aspects in the hospital world, has brought me to uh, the wonderful sunny shores of Australia and uh, I get now to head up the training department at South Trade and uh, we look after a wonderful portfolio of spirits but of course my, uh, my, my sort of shining light in that portfolio is our American whiskey selection and, and Buffalo Trace is at the heart of that so uh, look it's my pleasure to represent that here and um, I'm not sure if, uh, if we're looking at uh, talking to people that have already um, 
experienced the wonders of Buffalo Trace. Hopefully a lot of you have. Uh, if some haven't, then um, I don't know what you've been doing for the last 20 years, but it's time to catch up. So um, yeah, quick thing about Bourbon and Buffalo Trace. The history of Buffalo Trace dates back to the 1770s, which uh, is an enormous history and something that we're very proud of because we've got this continuous production that uh, has gone through world wars and prohibition and everything else. You know, we were one of the licensed distilleries to continue production through prohibition, which is a fantastic story because at the time, you know, during prohibition, you couldn't sell alcohol or make it or import it and distribute it and that sort of thing. So when you had a, a specific license granted, it was a medicinal license, which is beautiful to think that, you know, if you were sick in Kentucky in those days, you were able to go to the doctors and get prescription for what was then a pint of whiskey, right? So I don't know about uh, current pandemic and lockdowns, but I'm sure there was a lot of sick people in Kentucky during prohibition, that's for sure. Um, the ideal thing about that for us in terms of our history is that when you know repeal came around in 1933, we were in a great position to actually sell some aged whiskey because we were continually producing, um, which kind of gave us a bit of a springboard into the, um, the, the whole kind of success that we've now been able to afford. So with our history dating back to then, we've been always been that kind of the pioneers of, of bourbon and, and American whiskey. We've always looked to push boundaries. Um, our master distillers are, you know, some of the most incredible names dating back from the E.H. Taylors, the George T. Staggs and Blantons and those kind of guys. Uh, right up to today, we're in the hands of Harlan Weekly, who's just a, an incredible visionary and uh, someone who's spearheading what the future looks like for Buffalo Trace. So that's exciting. Um, in terms of our regulations, I know you mentioned that, George, just to kind of touch on those sort of things. Basically, you know, if you remember your ABCs, then, then you know about bourbon. So A is America. We have to make bourbon in America. Uh, we have to use brand new charred oak barrels. Um, that's significant because, you know, it's a one-time use, which is uh, like, you know, music to the ears of all the other whiskey producers around the world because they get all the barrels of bourbon. Um, and C is about corn. So when we talk about bourbon, it's really all about a majority of a corn in that what we like to call a mash bill. It's the recipe of grains. Um, and there's a couple other things on from that, which is a little bit technical, but I think we'll stick with the romance of the of the spirit first, right? And um, like, what I find great now compared to let's say, you know, twenty years ago when I started drinking is the amount of great bourbons and American whiskies that we have now. Um, why should people drink bourbon? Gee, because w when I first started drinking, there was some cheap bourbons out there and they were very, very sweet. And the first time probably that I tried it was in a, a mixer can or it was very sweet and, and I didn't really enjoy it. And yeah. why should we start drinking? Bourbon? Yeah, it's a good point. You know, up until quite recently, we were, uh, as in, in terms of Australia's consumption, we were the highest per capita consumer of bourbon in the world. And, um, the majority of those numbers were coming out because of the amount of RTDs that we enjoy in this country. And predominantly that was driven by uh, one or two major brands, which, you know, kind of um, put bourbon on the map in Australia. And they did so in such a, um, a powerful way that even today, you know, we are faced with the idea of, of trying to um, help consumers understand that there is a world of bourbon outside of those, you know, two or three major brands. So um, whilst we support the whole category, we still have to try and expand and make sure that people are allowed to, you know, make decisions. What we've seen recently is a great shift and, and a movement into that sort of premiumization and the ca categories expanded. So lots and lots of brands have, have, have come into Australia now where, you know, we can, um, we can pick and choose, we can experience different flavors and tastes because I think from a, a whiskey point of view uh, across the board, I mean, I love my Scotch and Irish and, and, and every other whiskey producer that, that comes across my desk. I love uh, experimenting, but in terms of American whiskey, you know, we, we really rely on 
a couple of key factors to make sure that our flavor profiles vary. And that's all about aging and selection. And those two things I think are critical to, uh, to every producer, certainly at Buffalo Trace, where we make our spirit, we make basically you know, four different spirit bases. And, uh, and from there we make um, an abundance of different whiskies, which are categorized in, in, in sort of two of those key elements aging and selection. So um, the reason I think why we should be encouraging people to drink more bourbon is there's so much variety in that category. And, um, you know, from, from products like Buffalo Trace and Eagle Rare um, into some of the antique collections where you get cask strength bourbon, which really is, uh, is a game changer for even your, your kind of your staunch uh, scotch whiskey fan um, it can really turn heads so I think as a category it's really uh, a fun place to be yeah, and I find that when I present a good bourbon to customers it's very rare that some will say that they don't like it most of them are actually surprised and, and happy that they've tried it because they think of it's a lot for me like tequila a lot of people have that bad time with tequila mm -hmm. and they just yeah. refuse to touch it and uh yeah, there's some fantastic bourbons and American whiskies in Australia at the moment that we can get. So let's run through a bit of a tasting, G. What, what are we meant to be tasting here? Because uh, yeah. it smells delicious. Uh, yeah, I mean, Buffalo Trace is, is the flagship brand. You know, we sort of renamed uh, the distillery back in 1999 when we launched Buffalo Trace. Um, the, the brand itself really is about the kind of uh, the epitome of what a rye bourbon is really all about for us, certainly at, at Buffalo Trace. And the, um, the, the character really is only developed after our aging. It's an extended aging pro process, which goes through a minimum of eight years. So eight to 10 years is when we select our barrels. And um, the master distiller is, is really in... Um, the mindset that we, we've only then gathered enough character, enough flavor profile for the whiskey. It's matured enough to be able to put into a bottle. So look, it's a huge investment. It's a, it's a big kind of, uh, it's a long wait, right? We put our spirit into barrels and, and roll them up there on a rick um, for, for eight to 10 years. Um, and over that period, you know, Maddie picked up earlier about evaporation, the angel share and, we probably lose about 40% of our barrels fill after about eight years, eight to 10 years. So it's an enormous investment, but um, you know, we don't cut corners. We, we just want to make sure that the, the whiskey coming out of those barrels is where we want it to be. Um, and for that, I think that uh, that comes through in the flavor profile. So Buffalo Trace, eight to 10 years, we've got a, a corn, and rye uh, malted barley mix. So, you know, in bourbon traditionally you have a rice style bourbon. Um, there is also a wheated version, but it's it's only in around about maybe five or 10% of bourbon that's made around the world or certainly sent around the world. Um, but for our style, I mean, Buffalo Trace is all about that robust kind of character. So if we go step back into 1999, I remember as bartender, the whole cocktail culture was shifting and, and changing at the time. And we were looking at drinking a lot more of those kind of serious pre-prohibition drinks again, you know, uh, from the Neo Martinis and the, the, the blended Fast and Furious to the kind of more upfront um, spirit forward cocktails like Old Fashions and Manhattans and, and Boulevardiers and that sort of thing. A lot more serious drinking going on and into the sort of millennium. So. With that, it was all about having a, a, a bourbon that stood up to those flavors and, and allowed us to be able to pour um, cocktails in that sense. So uh, Buffalo Trace launched and, and was a huge success overnight, you know, in, in certainly in London and New York at the time, the two kind of epicenters of cocktail culture. Um, and from that, you know, it's just been an education process because we just need to make sure that you know, we get liquid on lips. We allow people to, to understand the history, but also what's in the glass. Because one of the beautiful things I think that come out of Buffalo Trace is, is the, the line that we, we honor tradition, but we embrace change. And that's really all about, you know, understanding where our, our history is and, and what we've come from. But then also to look at how we 
proceed, how we push the boundaries, how we keep the spirit evolving and, um, and, and perfect those techniques. So um, I, I'm just, you know, as you can tell, I'm a big fan of, um, of American whiskey. Buffalo Trace is what we consider our, um, our breakfast whiskey. <laughs> what a good breakfast. Look, I, I'm a massive fan as well. I'm actually a massive fan with everything, and that's not just saying that I have all of these on my back bar at home. Uh, while the guys have still got a little bit left in their glass, uh, last time that Harlem was down, he told me to do the Kentucky Chew, and I thought he was actually <laughs> take, making fun of me. Can you explain the Kentucky Chew, please, for our viewers? That's a great question, mate. Excellent. Thank you for bringing that up, because actually just recently I was, um, I was in a... Fortunately, I was in a, in a session with a bunch of bartenders and I was talking to them about that very thing. And so <clears throat> for everyone online at the moment, when you do get a chance to visit Kentucky and any of the distilleries there, you'll find that when you go to a barrel room and you pop open a barrel and you get to taste some of that whiskey straight out of the barrel, the, um, the warehouseman, the, the distiller, the blender, whoever it might be that's in your company will taste that whiskey and immediately they'll start slapping their chops like as if they're as if they're chewing, right? And you know, initially I just thought that it was down to bad dental treatment. I don't know, many people didn't have much teeth or anything like that. But of course, it is a cultural thing. It's called the Kentucky Chew. So when you do experience your whiskey and you you taste that flavor washes over your palate. And of course your saliva glands go crazy, right? They wanna create all these flavors in your mouth. And so you naturally wanna chew that flavor, uh, which is a great, a great idea when you know, it comes to Kentucky whiskey, it's the Kentucky chew. So uh, that's pretty much what it's all about. It's accentuating the flavors in your mouth that um, you can get all that caramel and toffee and vanilla and spice and leather and all sorts of stone fruits and things like that, which is uh, it's a beautiful way to experience the whiskey. Yeah, it definitely works. Uh, so for those of you at home, feel free to do it. I just want to suggest <laughs> that you do it on the first Tinder date or anything like that. <laughs> so I think you'll uh, end too well. The next time I visit every bar that, I, you know, somebody's online, I want to see people go in there. Check this out. This is the Kentucky Chew. <laughs> we need to do a hashtag Kentucky Chew, I think, and uh, or it's get TikTok or whatever else they're doing. Kentucky Chew would be fun. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, look, um, I don't really, I think you've covered pretty much everything, the bourbon laws. Just a little bit about the climate. I was in Kentucky for about five minutes and uh, it was hot as hell there. Once again, like Maddie was talking about the climate here in Australia, yeah. what are we looking at roughly one year in Kentucky compared to... Uh, Scotland, for example, and also a little bit about heading up the warehouses. Yeah. Which I think Look, Woodford um, does as well. Yes, we do. It's, it's incredible to think that, you know, we've, we've had these warehouses in place since, uh, well, 17, 18, 1800s. And, and we've got this amazing expansion program going on at the moment, which I'll just touch on in a second. But thinking about, you know, each warehouse has a different part to play on the whiskey because of their makeup, whether they're brick built, stone built, whether they've got uh, tin roofs or slate roofs and, and they're positioning actually at the distillery as well, the airflow. I mean, the temperatures in Kentucky are pretty, well, I'd say recently they've changed a little bit, but usually you have your definite seasons. Um, because we have a brand new charred barrel, then the, the, the wood is very thirsty when we put the spirit in there we pretty much lose around 7% of that fill immediately into the wood, right? We're not getting that back. Um, but then, you know, as, as Harlan will um, explain, in the initial few years, the two or three years, we lose more like 5% per year in evaporation. Um, and then it slows down a little bit to about 3%. So, you know, roughly on average, as I mentioned with Buffalo Trace, eight to 10 years, you lose about 40%. Um, but at least 10% in your first year, which is uh, an enormous kind of a loss. We're, we, we use a, a 200 liter barrel, which is constant. And, um, you know, we don't top them up. We just have to deal with our, uh, our weather conditions. But 
One thing I think that's cool about Buffalo Trace is that, um, you know, we recognized a long time ago that whiskey stops breathing. We call it breathing in Kentucky, uh, aging. It stops breathing in the barrel below seven degrees centigrade. So we needed to kind of keep the conditions uh, at least a little bit warmer than that through the winter months. We have a lot of snow and, and frost through the winter. So, you know, we raise temperatures through the winter months. But um, currently we have this incredible expansion program. We're spending probably close to 1.5 billion US dollars. Um, and that involves a lot of different things. But the warehousing really is one of the key things. So we're building a new warehouse like every four months and filling it as quickly as we build it. Uh, we're about three years in now. So we've got about 10 new warehouses on, uh, it's actually a farmland adjacent to this site that you see behind me. And um, they're all holding around about 58, 58 and a half thousand barrels each. So we're looking at over another half a million barrels of bourbon being laid down. So, you know, in, in bourbon, um, in, in, the, in the quality and in the aspect of the future of bourbon, what we're looking at at Buffalo Trace is, is really a strong standpoint. You know, we don't believe that this is just a fad. Uh, we believe that bourbon is, is back where it belongs. And hopefully, um, you know, long into the future, people will be able to, uh, to experience the quality that comes out of this distillery. It's, it's an incredible um, process that hopefully everybody here online will get an opportunity to visit at least once um, to, to really fully experience what's going on there. Yeah, let's hope so. And uh, let's see, hopefully, what the day that uh, there's about 450,000 barrels of uh, whiskey in a warehouse in Melbourne would be fantastic too. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure you'd be happy with too, G. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, that was That's fantastic. So, guys, give bourbon or American whiskey a bit of a try. I know we all love Irish and Scottish as well and Aussie, but um, it's just fantastic to try so many great whiskeys. So, thanks a lot, G. All right, so next up... I'm going to introduce to you Mr. Linus Shaxman he. from Brown Foreman and you're talking today about Jack Daniels Rye. Who would have thought? Hi guys, thanks for having me. My name is Linus Shaxman. I'm the brand ambassador for, for Jack Daniels. I've been with the company for 14 years. <laughs> but you know, it's great business with great people. Why would you leave? Um, we're going to chat about Jack Daniels Rye. I might chat about Jack Daniels first to sort of set a bit of a scene and then we'll dive into Jack Rye and the Rye category. Obviously, um, you know, Jack Daniels was a real person. I know it sounds quite obvious, but he was a real person. Uh, he was born in Lynchburg, Tennessee sometime in uh, uh, September 1850. At the, at the age of 13, he went to work for nearby, uh, I forgot, called uh, Dan Cool. And he started making whiskey for, with a guy called Uncle Nearest, Nathan Green, who was a, a free black slave. And, started making the whiskey. Three years later, he went, he went back to Lynchburg, Tennessee, to a place called Cave Spring Hollow. Started making his, his own whiskey, Jack Daniels. Uh, won the very British Fair, which put him on the, uh, on the, on the, on the world scene. Uh, and unfortunately, he died quite young. Um, you've probably heard it from, mostly from Helen, because of the guys, you know, whiskey went through a pretty tough time during Prohibition. But uh, obviously, we, we weathered the storm, we came back making Jack Daniels. And then in 1943, we actually went to Congress and we actually campaigned to not be called a bourbon. Because uh, at the time, bourbon wasn't that good at the time. Obviously, bourbon was great now. Back in the 1930s and 40s, it wasn't that, that great. And we actually got, we got, we got, we got declared that we were a, a Tennessee whiskey. So just building on what was said before, obviously, a Tennessee whiskey, we adhere to all of the bourbon laws. Absolutely. You know, the ABCs, as we say before, we just do an extra step. We just... After it's distilled and before it goes into a barrel, it gets charcoal mellowed. It goes through 10 feet of sweet, char uh, sweet charcoal, removes um, conjugates, esters, impurities. You get a lighter, softer whiskey as a result. So the, technically, um, a Tennessee whiskey is a straight bourbon, distilled and aged in Tennessee that's charcoal mellowed. And, you know, and Jack Daniels is what it is. It's a staple of, of most bars, and, you know, it's a, but it's that charcoal mellowed that makes us different. We're talking about rye, aren't we? Because rye, rye is, rye is, rye is, rye is in, rye is, rye is back. And you know, we, I think Helen was saying before that for the 70s and the 80s, like whiskey just, just, oh, I think all whiskey 
was hurting. Scotch, Irish, American, and none more so than Rye. After Prohibition, Rye never came back. It, it didn't. It was known as like a, a, a gangster spirit. It was a poor person spirit. And a bit of a spike in the 60s with that whole madman era. Uh, but then it just died. You know, long came vodka. Uh, Disco killed whiskey and made vodka queen of spirits. And vodka is important, but we have a chunk of whiskey today. And you know, I saw this really great stat in 2007. There were 40 to 49 nine litre cases sold of rye in America. Mm. And nine litre cases, about 13 bottles. So it was almost dead. It was almost defunct. And, you know, and obviously there was this trend towards like you know traditional cocktails those the, yeah, the, from the 1880s. People started appreciating whiskey and they wanted to were chasing flavour. You know, and brands like Woodford Reserve and Jack Daniels, we jumped on this rye, this rye bandwagon. And um, in 2019, it's now 1.9, sorry, 1.2, 90 decades old in America. So this, this spirit has just come out the blocks and it's absolutely flying. In fact, back in 2007, there was only three commercial brands available. There's now over 100. So, so rye is back in the big way and people want to try Rye, and I think, you know, obviously Wilford did a rye in you know, 2005, but we bought out this rye, well, sorry, we didn't, we, we put down this rye in, in 2012. We bought, I remember the, the new make we had? Did you yes. get a bottle of that? Yeah. We announced that we were making a rye, we announced we bought out a Jack Daniels rye new make, and we changed our mash bill. I mean, Jack has done a few things over the years, but we've never, ever changed our mash bill. And the mash bill of Jack Daniels is 80 corn uh, to 8 rye, to 12 multi bullet. That's our mash bill. We're pretty open, honest about it. But we changed our mash bill. So now this is 70% rye uh, 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 to, to, to 18 corn to 12% multi barley. So it was just a, a, just a game changer. And us, I think, making a rye just gave the rye category a little bit of, you know, it, it was real. It wasn't a fad. It wasn't just a, a, you know, a train passed in the night. It actually was. It was a real deal. And it was here. It was here to stay. So yeah, really exciting. Really exciting times. Yeah, look, I can remember probably 10, 12 years ago where you would literally, it was probably harder to get a bottle of uh, Rittenhouse Rye than it was Pappy Van Winkle. It was just so hard to get. Uh, and now we've gone from having probably about three ryes on the back bar when we opened 18th Amendment to close to 30, 40. Crazy. Um, it, it's massive. And uh, so as we go through the tasting of the rye, what do, what do we expecting to find like a, I get spice can you explain a little bit about why it's spicy? yeah so let's chat about the grains so you gotta chat about the grains first so obviously normally bourbon it's at least 51 percent corn as we were saying before so bourbon just think sweet think buttery think creamy then you've got your wheat that's that nice like sort of cake sort of sweetness and then you've got, you've got your barley which is just moving forward there's nice tropical notes from barley as well and you've got rye rye is just think think light spice think cinnamon Think uh, cardamom seeds. Think actually, think mint. Think chocolate. So it's quite a spicy sort of uh, grain. So, so just on the rye laws. Now the same laws as bourbon, just 51% rye as opposed to 51% corn in the mash bond. But everything else is exactly the same. So the A B, yeah, it's like A B, I guess rye, R for rye. But obviously, like any whiskey, first thing I do is just just look at it and. One thing about rye and bourbon, it's the honest spirit, it's just whiskey and water. So there's no caramel or burnt sugar or, you know, it's just whiskey water. And you see it's nice and thick and it's quite viscous. There's beautiful legs, those pearls on the side of the glass. Now, as Helen was saying before, just give it a smell. And I tend to open my mouth. This is a higher ABV, 45% ABV. You need the higher ABV to give the rye a bit of backbone so the flavour will carry through. And, and again, on the nose, get that rye straight away. You now, people say you get like, black pepper, maybe some cloves. Um, you get a hint of the ultra fruit you're going to taste in the palate. You get a hint of caramel butterscotch from the barrels, but I'm getting, it's that beautiful rye. It is quite a high rye content. It's kind of funny because for rye, mint is one of the main things that I pick up on, yeah. a, on a blind tasting, which is weird. Like, oh, I know, I, 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 I know, I know, you're right. I always get in, in a whiskey. <laughs> 100%, yeah, I always get mint and a hint of like, yeah. you know, obviously you get that like cinnamon and cardamom, obviously. The black pepper, for sure. I get a hint of cloves, that's just me. And just give it a taste. And when you give it a taste, like all whiskey, let it, let it coach your, your front, your mid, your back palate. And let it just slightly, slightly glow, glide over your, your tongue. Wow. It's really funny because it's got that Jack Daniels DNA. Mm. So it's the same water, it's the same barrels, it's the same yeast strain, 
it's still charcoal mellow, that sweet maple charcoal, after exploration, before aging. But all we've changed is just the mash bill content, so, so just heavy rice. So again, on, on, it actually tastes, it smells. The spice is there, I'll get more of that green apple and pears, orchard fruit coming through. I love how it just sits in the backpack, and that's what the mint comes back again. You go, there you go, there's the mint. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, I, I love, like, ABVs to me mean nothing, honestly. I mean, this is like a punchy ABV. I think it drinks below that ABV. It's just so well balanced and so well made. And it's not too thin. Like, I mean, I love rice. So there are some amazing rice out there. Like you, I'm, I keep buying whiskey. I can't stop buying whiskey. I'm running out of space. But some, but some rice are a little bit thin. You kind of start chasing the flavour. And the, the, the many reasons why, that I'm not too sure. But um, this, to me... It's got depth of flavour, and you know we're using a, a, like a post-prohibition, like an all-star mash bill. So we're using the rye, the corn, and the barley. Some guys just use rye, and that's fine. But I tend to find they can be a tiny bit thin, whereas those that you know using the corn and the barley does give this a bit of a depth of flavour and more complexity, and, yeah. and just 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 more character. Yeah, and I, I hear that like rye as a, a grain is pretty hard to work with. Yeah, it, 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 it can be messy, uh, as, especially when you're actually, you know, creating the sweet mash, absolutely, it can be a pain in the bum, but as a grain, it actually is quite sustainable to grow, it grows, it's easy, it's, 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 it will take, it you know, in the cold weather, it still grows, it's, it, if the soil isn't very rich in nutrients, it still grows, but you have to actually work, it can be an utter pain in the bum, and although we love it and the flavours it brings, to work with it, it can be quite challenging, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I love Will it. we ever see a Starwood? Oh, come on, Rye. This is, this, is, this is the time, exclusive. Tell us all, <laughs> when's the first Starwood um, Rye? Not that I know of. Yeah, the, the, uh, the new make stays consistent. Um, but we, we're always open to experimenting, so maybe down the line. Never say never. Um, but yeah, I, I, love, I love Jack Daniels Rye. Like that mint comes through, like yeah. perfect mint juleps. Yeah. yeah it's summertime, like, yeah, super refreshing. Yeah, cool. It's funny because people are now mixing with rye, and we, we know it started in bars like this. People were using it for those old style cocktails, but I mean, even at home, we're saying before, boiler makers. So, you know, I, 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 last night I was actually practicing for today, so I was drinking Guinness, I was drinking <laughs> Jack Daniels rye, and it went really well together just quietly. Uh, again, I was working really hard last night. I hope you appreciate the sacrifice that I make for you guys. But even like I said before, Rye and dry. So it's actually it's actually a, a rye July next month. So we're celebrating July with rye and just like just rye and dry, good quality, uh, good quality dry, big glass, heaps of ice, squeeze of fresh lime, absolutely perfect. Um, or even this, this high balls are back. You're saying before, like you know, just just whiskey, heaps of ice, tall glass, soda water, some citrus, absolutely great. I, I'm not trying with tonic water, but you've inspired me to go home again, start working again, try with tonic <laughs> water and, and some some grapefruits. The classic cocktails, the Sazerac, the Bouvardiers, like they're back, back, back. It's got the backbone stand up to those, those spirit forward cocktails. And you know what? It's going to sound sweet, a Mai Tai. We call it a Rai Tai. It sounds crazy, but it works. It works so well. Some pineapple, some orge, some, some, um, some, some bits of bitters, some fresh lime, of a crushed ice. It's actually it's a lot of fun, but really, really tasty. So it's a really versatile spirit. But um, yeah, it, it's. It's, you know, I said, I strongly into it, the right character was a big deal. Uh, I think it's a, it was a great thing we've done. It has got the Jack DNA. I get a hint of banana there. Maybe it's yeah. psychosomatic, I'm not too sure, but I always get a hint of banana <laughs> there. Do. Yeah, it's definitely there, but it's yeah. just complex and, yeah, just well made and, yeah, tip top. That's great. And I like that it is a little bit higher in ABV. I found my latest cocktail that I'm drinking at the moment is a Black Manhattan where I'll use... Uh, Jack Rye and then have Averna instead yep. of uh, a sweet vermouth and I find that if I use something that's a bit lower ABV it's not sort of coming through enough but that's great dedication. Uh, I hear Ross Blaney's been <laughs> practicing for the last 10 years for today drinking every single day so uh, yeah there's a bit of commitment between uh, all of you. <laughs> it's, it's called brand loyalty, it's called <laughs> training, dedication. Oh well, yeah it's so, training, uh, exactly we've got to. <laughs> Like I know, I got a bottle sent to me recently. You've got something new at Jack Daniels you want to talk about before I hand hey, over to the great hey, man? Hey, obviously it's a little bit off, off topic. We have got the Jack Daniels apples coming out. Uh, it is obviously, it's a whiskey liqueur. Uh, uh, 
35% ABV using real apples in the actual syrup. Um, it's gone nuts. It's gone crazy. It's not quite here yet. So I'm almost scared to mention it because we, we, we're getting hammered for, for, for supply at the moment. But it's just on the corner. Um, yeah, it's an absolute cracker. And I, I can have to, have to play with cocktails. The other day I made some cocktails and it stands up in cocktails really, really well. Although the kids might have it straight. So I'm, I'm more of a sipping kind of guy um, but it's it's here I think it's out next month and you'll see in obviously in Paramount and bottle shops and it is an absolute cracker it's really yeah, I've got a bottle times. at home it's pretty good I, I bought a bottle back from Tennessee and had it oh, at did you? bar you, you, and it ran out straight away and I uh, thought I was the only one and then I saw it's coming out now so I'm a bit disappointed although it lasted about a week <laughs> uh, thank you so much Linus anytime uh, brother live from Sydney Mr Ross Blaney <laughs> Hello, George. How you doing? Hi, everyone Good, else. Thank you. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm getting a bad rap here for just drinking loads. <laughs> it's only because you're in Sydney and you can't hit me. <laughs> well, fair enough. That is true. And I am now stuck in my house with a, a decent selection. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably get through a little bit of it in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Fantastic. So would you like to introduce yourself, please, while I pour the guys some Clenfetic 12? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. I'll pour myself one as well, actually, maybe. Um, now that I've got the reputation for drinking, I might as well actually do it. But my name is Ross Blaney. I'm the brand ambassador for Glenfiddich and also the Balvenie, which is sitting behind me here. Um, I've been working in whiskey really since I was old enough to, since I was 18, 19, starting working in pubs. And a bit more recently, I've been looking after Balvenie for the last uh, bit, almost five years now. And in the last year, took over Glenfiddich as well. So it's yeah, it's it's great to have these two incredible Speyside single malts to work with, uh, both with quite different personalities. I can look at them as personalities and different great whiskies. Um, but yeah, I've just I've just always loved whiskey. I think for me, it always was about the stories behind the whiskey. It was like where did they come from? Who was making them? You know, reading the back of the label back when I was eighteen, nineteen, getting into whiskey, I didn't really have any other way of learning about whiskey. But it was literally just like. You know, picking up the bottle, reading the label, looking at the tube, reading all that stuff. And I was just amazed looking at all the different single malts, how how different they all were. And it was a different person that made them. So, yeah, I've just always been really interested in that. Um, and now there's plenty of stories around Glenfiddich for me to tell, which is quite nice. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And uh, I, I definitely suggest that. I, I used to tell staff many years ago that if it's quiet, start cleaning down, you know, the bottles on the back bar. But read the bottles there's so much information on there that you can pass on to customers and just for your own knowledge uh there is so much information on them so there, there is so much i mean even like even the glenfiddich bottle itself like there's the stag and the v underneath it so glenfiddich even the name glenfiddich being glen is a you know, scottish word for valley fiddich being deer and then if you didn't know that but just up above it you've got the v which is essentially the valley which is in the bottle shape and then we've got our, our stag, our 12 point stag, which is known as a monarch of the Glen, which is in there. So there's like, you know, in all sorts of bottles, there's all these little telltale signs of the story behind it. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And uh, I guess Glenfiddich is probably one of the most seen uh, single malt whiskies that you see in bars. I, I think you guys have, have, is it a challenge to get it on every single bar? It's a lot like uh, Jack, old number seven and, and Jamison as well. Is, is that something that you guys really push on so that everyone, because for me, Glenfiddich is your perfect sipping whiskey for someone, whether you're a novice or someone that wants a little bit of a change back from something a little bit more meatier. It's always fantastic. It's, it's a really nice entry level and advanced whiskey. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. It kind of sits in between those things. I mean, Glenfiddich's been around for a long time. It's been, it will be 134 years this year, so 1887. But I think the important thing and why Glenfiddich is in so many shells, I mean, it's been the biggest selling single malt in the world for a long time, um, really since the single malt category started, which was in 1963. And the category started, well, early 60s and then officially in 1963. But that was Glenfiddich. And it was Glenfiddich was the first real single malt that went out. It was called pure malt back then. And every year since then, it's been the biggest selling single malt, kind of because we had a head start. I mean, we started the category, so we had a little bit of a head start, but also because it was good, good whiskey. I mean, everyone was drinking blends before that. Um, when William Grant, our founder, and his wife Elizabeth and their 
seven sons and two daughters. When they built Glenfiddich in 1887, they weren't planning on selling Glenfiddich. They built Balveni five years later, just up the road, literally about, well, about seven minutes walk up the road, depending on how many whiskies you've had. And um, they were doing it to make grants. They were wanting to make grants. That was their whole point because no one drank single malt. But eventually when it got to the early 60s, the, the Grant family, who's still in the company now, they were looking at Glenfiddich and they were thinking, well, this whiskey is great on its own anyway. Like, why don't we just sell this whiskey as Glenfiddich and put Glenfiddich on the label and say this is just a pure malt whiskey made from 100% malted barley just from our distillery. And I think a lot of people thought they were kind of crazy. They thought it was a kind of weird thing to do, but they believed in their whiskey. So when they decided to go out there and market it as a pure malt as it was back then, it was it was really popular and it was good whiskey. And it's now, I mean, this is, the whiskey we're drinking today is essentially the same whiskey as we made back then. That's kind of why it is in most bars. And the thing I've probably enjoyed most about since I started doing Glenfiddich as well as Balveni is that so many people come up to me and they say, oh, I've got this great memory around Glenfiddich. You know, a, a taxi driver I was in with one day said that, he didn't even know I worked for Glenfiddich, but he said that uh, when his brother got married, they bought a bottle of Glenfiddich 12 and they drank half of it. And not all at once, obviously, responsible service of alcohol and all that stuff. But um, they kept the other half for when he got married. And then when we told him we worked for Glenfiddich, he was, you know, he was almost quite emotional to meet someone from Glenfiddich. So it was, it's quite nice. It's, it's been around and it's been so readily available that it's been part of a lot of people's memories, which is really nice. Yeah, look, I'm glad that they uh, they did that. So can you just have, you touched on about blended whiskey. What is the difference between a single malt whiskey and a blended whiskey? So really, when you're looking at blended whiskey, which is uh, almost 90% of all whiskey that's sold in the world, or, or Scotch whiskey, sorry, um, blended whiskies will be usually roughly 50% made from a grain whiskey like wheat. Um, and these are great whiskies. They're just slightly different style. They're slightly easier and less expensive to make in that style. So about 50% of that. And then the other 50% will be made up of a collection of different single malts. So it could be anywhere between three and 40, uh, however many you want. So each, <clears throat> each master blender, like our master blender, Brian Kinsman, who's also the malt master of Glenfiddich, when he's making grants, he's essentially trying to make uh, the same product with grants all the time, every year, consistent, tasty, easy to drink. And they've got these different ingredients. These single malts might change every year, but blends will be made up of all these different single malts being married together to create one consistent flavor and quite easy going flavor. Whereas when you get to single malt, single malt's more, well, it's 100% malted uh, barley, what it's made from, and made from one distillery. So it's kind of like a, it's a product of a place and the people and everything else around it. It's like, it's got this character of where you are. So we're based in Dufftown in the Northeast of Scotland. And it's, yeah, it's like a, it's like a picture within the whiskey of like everything that's around there from the air, the weather, the, the people and everything else. So that's, that's kind of the difference between the two of them. That's awesome. So as we go to nosing this whiskey, what do we look at? I, I, it's funny, I just had a bit of a, a nose and I got honey for the first time ever. Yeah, I get honey. You guys get that? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite sweet. Um, I mean, for the, the 12, the way that we make this one, we want it to be, we want it to be light and refreshing and fruity and sweet. Uh, we, this is the one that most people are gonna have first. So we wanna make sure it's absolutely incredible. You know, some people might skip past the 12 because they think, oh, that's only the 12 year old. I wanna try something older than that or better than that. But I mean, as with most distilleries everywhere, not just in Scotland, the one that's maybe the lowest age or the most affordable is sometimes one of the best ones because that's what people are going to try first. So they're going to get it again. But we get that really nice sweetness. We age in both American oak ex bourbon barrels and European oak ex Oloroso sherry barrels. This one's about 85, 90% American oak. So that's where you get that nice kind of honey and vanilla and all these beautiful sweet flavors from the American oak. And then just a little touch of European oak flavor X Oloroso sherry barrels. So that's more like that kind of darker dried fruit and spice like cinnamon nutmeg. But this is just a little bit of that in there. So it's more about those fresh fruity and like vanilla, honey, uh, apple, pear, those kind of flavors. Yeah, mm. I think it works brilliantly in cocktails too, having that 
that pear and apple, uh, especially in a highball, it's amazing. Yeah, it does. It blends itself so well to um, so many different drinks. I was thinking as you were chatting to the other guys there, um, you know, like signature serves and things like that. And, you know, I, well, I love it just like that. But a couple that have been playing around with recently, actually, you mentioned the Black Manhattan there, George. I have to try that. That sounds amazing. I've never had that before. Um, Beautiful. If you want to learn how to make it, check out my Let's Talk Drinks channel. Wow. <laughs> Shameless. Boom, there's, there's, there. there's my shameful. Uh, you can give me that 20 know. bucks later for leading you into that one. Um. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it's a great drink. And um, as I said, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to get people to drink single malts, introducing them to Glenfiddich 12. So there are a few other different ones there, like uh, the Winter Storm and stuff like that. What's your favourite? And let's not talk about high age statements because you've got the access to them. Is, is the 12 one of your go-tos or? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, without looking at the, the older older whiskies, the 12 is, is such a, a, an easy go-to. It's like one that I would have while I'm thinking what else I'm going to have after it. But if I'm choosing my favorite, it's it's the 15, the Solera. The 15, it's just, uh, it's, it's so good. And it's made in such an unusual way I mean, it was it was made well, almost twenty odd years ago by our David Stewart, who was our malt master back then, who's now known as the Balvenie malt master, and he's fifty ninth year with Balvenie this year. But he decided to create this Solera Reserve or Solera Vat, uh, which is a, a big kind of eight thousand liter ton or barrel. And what he did back then is they would fill it up with fifteen year old single malt made from three different barrels. So we'd have uh, ex bourbon, ex sherry and then ex-bourbon that is finished in virgin oak, so brand new American oak. And they fill it up to the top, and then they only ever, they'd leave it in there for four months, and then they only ever empty it halfway. So when they're doing a bottling, they empty it halfway, and then fill it up with whiskies that match the same flavor profile. And the point of that was going back to the blends thing about consistency. It was trying to find a new way of being very consistent whiskey. So if you only ever half empty it, it can, it can only change so much if you're filling it up with similar flavors. And it's just it's such a, a beautiful whiskey. It's rich and it's bold. It's quite different to the 12, actually, when you just jump a couple of years up or three years up. But yeah, that's, that's got to be my favorite. Oh, that's awesome. It's actually the, the biggest selling of the Glenfiddichs at my bar, the 15. Yeah, so there you go. Um, a little question as well about whiskey. I, I've been lately collecting stuff from the 80s and so forth. Does whiskey age once it's in the bottle? Because I get so many friends that will say, hey, George, I've got this whiskey. It's a 40-year-old whiskey. I go, wow, that's amazing. And it'll be, let's say, for example, a, a Johnny Walker red label, but they've had it for 20, 20 years. Can you explain to the guys, I mean, obviously know the answer to that, does it get any better in the bottle? And one step further, at what point, does it change if you've got, say, just a third of the bottle left? Does the oxidisation change the whiskey? Yeah, that's a, a great question. It's one that I get asked quite a lot as well. Um, I mean, basically the answer is no, it doesn't change once it's in the bottle. It's changing while it's in the barrel. It's getting influence from the oak and the air around it. But once it's in the bottle and it's sealed, it's not changing at all. Um, the, when you're looking at older bottles, though, like that can be quite interesting. I think especially with blended whiskey rather than single malt, when you get one from like the 80s or the 60s or you know further back, they can be quite different because they have different things going into them. But I'm uh, sorry, going back to your question, but once it's in the bottle, um, I usually think, I mean, once it gets down to maybe the last uh, quarter or maybe a, well, a little bit more than that, that's when you've got like a lot more air in the bottle. It'll probably still last about a year, but it's, I think once it gets down to about there, you're as well just finish it, I think. Um, it's also a good excuse to just finish it off. And you can blame that on me. You can blame, well, Ross said I should just finish it off. So <laughs> I think once it gets down to there. That's a great tip. And what about, uh, I know with bottles of wine, you can buy argan or some gas to pour into a whiskey. Guys, do you think that would make a difference? I don't think so, mate. <laughs> I'll let Ross I got that. asked recently, yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm not really sure. I've never done it. Yeah, I, I haven't either, actually. I mean, I, I suppose it would work because it just basically sucks out with the or it stops the oxygen stuck touching the wine. So I suppose it would work. But I mean, I prefer the other option of just drink it. 
Oh, absolutely. And drink it with friends or, or loved ones because I honestly believe that a, a whiskey that you enjoy in a really great environment tastes way better if you're with friends, if you're a beautiful venue like Beneath Driver Lane or uh, compared to drinking it at home or at worst just leaving it and collecting it and not touching it at all. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's why I've worked in whiskey so long is because it is about sharing it with people. I know all the other whiskies we've talked about tonight, I have some relationship with going back to drinking Jack Daniels when I was, well, when I was 18, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, everyone since then, great memories with different whiskies. And that's what it's about, sharing it with people, telling stories, having a laugh. That's what whiskey's all about. That's awesome. As we wind up, we've still got a few minutes left. Do you guys have any questions to ask each other? Wow. There you go, I'm going to put it on them. Yeah. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Can't think of any. I'm going to have a look here. We do have a question. Uh, what do you think about Brook Laddie and the stuff that's more contemporary whiskey distilleries are doing in Scottish whiskey? And that's probably an open question. We might actually go around. Uh, we might start with Matt. What do you think about the new whiskies come out? Uh, I mean, obviously, Brook Laddie's been around for a while. Yeah. Uh, with all these new... And you're in the same category. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Oh, I love it. Uh, Brook Laddie's a, a great distillery. I, I was lucky enough to visit a few years back, and they do some really cool things and breaking the, the norms of traditional whiskey and, you know, pushing the boundaries, especially with the, that peated expression, yeah. you know, the octomores and stuff, like really just pushing the envelope. And, uh, yeah, it's cool. It's exciting. It's, it gets people engaged, and more people drinking whiskey, the better. Yeah, now, look, I'm a massive fan too. Helen, I guess the same with Jamison. You've been around for a really long time. Do you find that these other distilleries that are playing around doing finishing casks and so forth is what keeps Jam Jamison evolving and, and doing new stuff? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, what's the term, a rising ship, or what is that term? Yeah, like, you know, it carries, it's all bringing into the Irish whiskey category and some distilleries are doing fabulous things. Um, there's a really interesting one I was, I tasted recently, it was the Dubliners Honeycomb Liqueur. Like, you know, people are really changing it up and playing around. So I think that's, that's amazing, really, and bringing more people into the category, which is great. Especially with Jamison, because I get to try it in a few other different ways, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The next question from Angus Thompson. It is for you, Matt, but I'm going to pass it on to G because he's sort of related. Uh, what would you recommend uh, the twofold by Starwood in what sort of cocktails? Yeah, I think twofold lends itself to quite a, a number of drinks, actually, because it's got just that beautiful kind of backbone. Of, um, of of the wheat and the and the single malt whiskey, it's um, you know when when somebody first put the two fold and tonic in front of me, I was a skeptic. I was kind of like, really tonic, uh, but it works really well. I, I just love the idea of whiskey being able to be drank in its kind of mixability form. It's I know Dave Broom once mentioned that you know the popularity of whiskey was all about mixability. It wasn't about drinking it on its own. And we've kind of evolved into that idea where we can just sip and savor, which is a nice idea. But, um, you know, we've always got to keep an eye on, on the, the, um, the option or, or the, the, the produced kind of uh, idea of mass marketing, mass consumption, because the majority of people will have like a highball or a, or a mixed drink. My favorite with twofold is actually just a, a straight up sour, you know, simple mix, nice big glug of twofold, a little bit of fresh lemon juice, balance it out with a bit of sugar. And um, it's beautiful. It just comes through really nicely in the bottom. Uh, if you guys available through Paramount, um, beautiful. And it works really well with Jamison. I haven't tried it with the Glen Fiddy. I've tried it with it with Jack Rye. Yeah, the, the, Jack Rye. The, the user as well. Yeah. So if you set some lemon and lime. It's beautiful. Got another question here from Jamie. Hey there, what a what was the name of the YouTube channel? Is someone taking oh. a joke? Yeah. You mentioned we love some more George in my life. Yum yum, going down smoothly on <laughs> the Glenfiddich. Wow, Radio right Jamie. It's <laughs> really cool, blood. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> send me a number there, buddy. It's uh, <laughs> let's talk drinks. Please add and subscribe. <laughs> I'm yeah, brutal, aren't I? Just, <laughs> 
<laughs> right, look, uh, we're nearly there. Are there any last questions? Guys, thank you so much for joining us. It's been amazing. Are we going to wrap it up? Yeah. The well, QR thanks very much for having us, guys. Yeah, thank great you. stuff, George. Yeah, thanks for having us. Blanche. <laughs> thank you so much. Keep using Paramount because they paid us all to do this and it's the best uh, place to buy your spirits from. We love them, don't we, Linus? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Thank you. You guys get paid and, for this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in whiskey. Glenn Fiddick. Apparently you're sending it to me. <laughs> I'm sure we can work it. <laughs> and once again, lucky last, thank you so much to Hamish and the guys here from Beneath Driver Lane. It's been a while since I've been here due to COVID. I might have to hang around. So uh, thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Maddie, Thank you very much. Linus, Cheers, all. See you again Cheers, soon. Guys. Cheers. Stay well, stay safe.